Today, we're thrilled to have with us Trita Parsi to discuss his most recent book, Single Roll of the Dice, Obama's Diplomacy with Iran. The book is for sale, is on sale here today, so please pick up a copy, and at the end of the talk, um, Trita will also be available to sign the books. Trita Parsi is the founder and president of the National Iranian American Council and an expert on US-Iranian relations. Iranian Foreign Policy and the Geopolitics of the Middle East. He's the recipient of the Council of Foreign Relations 2008 Arthur Ross Silver Medallion and the 2010 Grahmeyer Award for Ideas Improving World Order. Joining the discussion as a discussant is Abbas Maliki, Abbas Maliki, who served as Iran's Deputy Foreign Minister from 1988 to 1997. He's currently in residence at MIT as a Robert E. Wilhelm Fellow in the Center for International Studies. He's an associate professor of energy policy at Sharif University of Technology in Tehran and director of the International Institute for Caspian Studies. Moderating our talk is Stephen Kenzer, an award-winning foreign correspondent, correspondent who has covered more than 50 countries on five continents. His articles and books have led the Washington Post to place him among the best in popular foreign policy storytelling. He teaches international relations at Boston University, and his most recent book is Reset, Iran, Turkey, and America's Future. After the talk, we'll open up um, for a question and answer session, and I just want to remind everyone to use the mics. And finally, please join me in welcoming our speakers. Oh, well, thank you all for coming, and uh, especially at this particular moment when the, uh, Iran seems to have taken over so much of our national conversation, it's great to see so many people turning out. It's really remarkable that this country has now become uh, the central foreign policy focus of our presidential campaign in the United States. Um, I think when uh, a lot of members of Congress get interested in your country, there's always reason to worry. Uh, and certainly that, that's the case now. Um, we are seeing kind of a political feeding frenzy that makes it difficult uh, for people to pull back and try to look at this situation uh, with a little bit of equanimity. That's what we're going to try to do tonight. Uh, so uh, I think we'll, from Trita's point of view, there are at least a, a two things we want to hear about. First of all, uh, Trita has become the leading expert, really, on uh, what's been happening in Washington in terms of Washington's diplomatic relationship with, uh, with Iran. And uh, this is the subject of his new book. So I want to ask him to try to give us as a full a summary as he can of the material that's, that's in that book and uh, of the new insights that uh, we've been able to gain thanks to his research. Then I'd like to take off from there towards the other part of our talk and then uh, go into the question of what's happening in Iran now. Um, presumably, there'll be a volume two of this book one day, and uh, let's get a little insight into that. But first, Trita, I'd love it if you can try to tell us a little bit about uh, what you found as you traced the history of Obama administration diplomacy with uh, Iran. I'm, I'm often asked, and you're probably asked this many, much more often than I am, so what happened? Uh, we had all those terrible threats from the Bush administration. Finally, the Bush administration was over. The Obama administration came into office saying, we're going to extend the hand of friendship to Iran. There was going to be a completely different tack. And the next time we looked back again, we were practically at the brink of war. So what got us from there to here? Excellent. Thank you so much. It's a great, great pleasure being here. Does this work? Good. Uh, it's a great pleasure being here. It's, it's a delight to be on a panel with two people who know so much about this topic and a room filled of people who are quite interested in it as well. I want to particularly thank uh, Steve Kinzer for being the person in the United States that have done more than anyone else to educate the American public about a very critical chapter in U.S.-Iran relations, and that is what happened in 1953. Had it not been for Steve Kinzer, most Americans would still not know about that issue. Uh, on the issue of what happened during Obama's um, presidency, I would, I would agree with you. It is quite interesting. Exactly three years after President Obama so famously in his inaugural address 
extends a hand of friendship to Iran and the Muslim world in hope that there would be an unclenched fist on the other side, we are pretty much back where we started, in which uh, Secretary of Defense Panetta said just about a few weeks ago that he views the risk of a military confrontation to be around 50-50. So how did we go from that very hopeful moment when Obama first came into power to the moment in which uh, Panetta felt that he needed to say or to share with the world uh, his estimation for the risk of war. But there's a couple of things I think we need to take into consideration. It's important to keep in mind that part of the reason why Obama in the first place even could make the argument for diplomacy was precisely because of the American public's rejection of the Bush foreign policy and the fundamental um, assumption, ideological assumption that it was relying on, which was that you do not talk to your enemies because if you do, you risk legitimizing them. The track record of that policy in the case of Iran was quite clear. In the Iranian case, they probably had less than 50 centrifuges in, 19, in 2000 when Bush came into power, and they had more than 8,000 by the time he left office. Iran was squeezed between a hostile regime in Afghanistan and a hostile regime in Iraq. By the time Bush left, Iran had become the kingmaker of the political order in those two countries. And it has also expanded its soft power by cleverly taking advantage of America's declining popularity in the region. That gave Obama a political opening in which he could do something that was quite unprecedented. He could go forward and make the case that we need to reconstitute diplomacy as the central tool of statecraft. A an approach that under normal circumstances would have been political suicide, you know, running on a platform of talking to the Iranians won't get you very far. But in 2008, it became a winning card precisely because of the rejection of the Bush foreign policy among the general American public. But that opening, was not going to be long lived according to the administration's own calculations. They felt that the political space for them to be able to pursue diplomacy would not last longer than approximately 12 months. And the reasons why it would close down was because A, the Iranians were continuing to amass low and rich uranium. By the time they got to 10, to 1,000 to 1,200 um, kilograms of LEU, that would be sufficient theoretically to build a bomb. And that would increase the pressure on the administration to take military action. Moreover, there was pressure from Israel and from Saudi Arabia, states who feared that in a diplomatic solution between the United States and Iran, the United States would cut a deal that essentially would come at their expense. And there was also a lot of skepticism in some of the European um, capitals, particularly in France, where there was a fear that Obama would be so eager to strike a nuclear deal with the Iranians that he would sacrifice long-standing West and red lines on that issue. Among America's many close friends, many wished Obama well, but very few wished him success. And that was a reality that he had to deal with throughout this period. And of course, he ran into difficulties from the very outset, because A, it took about four months for him to do a policy review and come up with what the actual strategy for the policy would be. So four out of the 12 months were gone. Then the next dilemma that they were dealing with was, should they or should they not talk to the Iranians prior to the Iranian elections in June 2012? The arguments were essentially that if they did talk, was there any certainty that the Iranians actually could negotiate while they're in the midst of their political season? And if they could, would talking to the Ahmadinejad government right before the elections give him a boost in the elections? And Obama essentially could potentially become credited for securing his re-election. So the decision was to not go forward with diplomacy until after the elections, but that also meant that six of the 12 months would have passed by the time they potentially could get to talks. But what the administration, of course, did not expect was that rather than having some level of political clarity on June 13th, the day after the elections, it was quite the opposite because you had allegations of massive fraud, and of course, massive human rights abuses taking place on the streets of Tehran and other cities of Iran in front of the entire world to see. And you had a political elite that essentially became at war with itself and with society at large. 
Iran became paralyzed. There was no prospects for diplomacy under those circumstances because there was really no one that could talk from the other side. And that created a problem for the administration on two different levels. First, because it further cost them a lot of time. It was not clear any longer how long they may have to wait before the dust had settled, as the president said, in Iran, in which they actually could pursue talks. And secondly, the elections and the human rights abuses that followed it became the first moral dilemma for the administration. It really became a major blow to the administration's moral comfort with the idea of pursuing negotiations. It was one thing to talk about it in the abstract, theoretically. It was a different thing to actually conduct it with a government that at that same time was engaged in such visible human rights abuses. But something had happened only 10 days before the elections that had given the United States the confidence that there was some promise to diplomacy. And that was that the Iranians had actually sent a letter to the head of the IEA in Geneva saying that they needed to buy fuel pads for their research reactor in Tehran. A reactor that was producing medical isotopes for about 850,000 Iranian cancer patients. Fuel pads are built off of low enriched uranium. And the administration had been thinking about what kind of an idea could they come up with to convince the Iranians to give up their stockpile of LEU. And if they could manage to push down the stockpile well below the 1,000 kilo line, then that would be sufficient to reduce the likelihood or the risk of an Iranian breakout and add time to the nuclear clock. Now they had an opportunity because suddenly the Iranians themselves were coming with a request uh, in which this could be married into. And the idea essentially became, instead of selling the Iranians fuel pads, the West would offer Iran to take Iran's low and rich uranium, turn it into fuel pads, and give it back to the Iranians. That way, the West would get what it needed, which was to reduce the stockpile and the breakout capability of the Iranians. And the Iranians would get what they had requested, which was to get fuel pads for their reactor. That opening is what caused the administration to, uh, in spite of the election mayhem, really stick to its guns on diplomacy and just waiting to see when it could start. By late August, it was clear to them that waiting much longer would not be a, a productive activity because there was no indication of when the dust would settle. So they decided to take a risk. And the risk was to request a meeting with the Iranians at the P5 plus one level and try to see if they're capable of negotiating, knowing very well that it could fail precisely because of the domestic infighting in that country. On October 1st, 10 months into the president's 12 months period, um, for the first time, the US, the Iranians, uh, and the rest of the Security Council states plus Germany meet in Geneva, and the idea is presented to the Iranians of a fuel swap without necessarily going into great details. The Iranians accept it in principle, and there's a decision to have a follow-up meeting very shortly thereafter. October 19th, they meet in Vienna, and that is the time when the real details, they meet at the technical level. That's the time when the details of the deal is presented to the Iranians. And the details are that the West is requesting 1,200 out of Iran's 1,500 kilos of LEU, meaning 75% of their stockpile, to be shipped out to Russia, Russians would re-enrich it to about 19.75%, ship it to France, they would turn it into fuel pads, and the Iranians would get the fuel pads about a year later. And it's at this moment that the Iranians start to object. Their first objection was, who invited the French to the party? Um, they had long-standing uh, problems with the French on the nuclear issue, and uh, it was not mentioned to them in Geneva that the French would be part of the deal, according to the Iranians. Um, so they spent the first day of the negotiations trying to cut the French out of the deal, which didn't really succeed. Their second objection was that, well, this dealing, this swap really puts most of the pressure, most of the risk on the Iranian shoulders. Because Iran doesn't trust the West just as much as the West doesn't trust Iran. If they're giving up their strategic asset and they're not going to get anything back until 12 months later, what's the guarantee that the West would not renege on the deal? And they gave suggestions such as they would be, uh, instead of giving out 1,200 kilos, they would give up it 
400 kilos in different shipments, but that wasn't acceptable to the United States. By the third day, it was clear the two sides were not going to be able to um, uh, come to a compromise. And al Barde essentially tells the negotiators that we can either go out and tell the media right away that we have failed, or you guys can take the proposal back to your capitals and come back within three days with a final answer. All sides agree in a gentleman's agreement to do that, to take it back, and to tell the media that the talks thus far had been constructed. Within three days, the Russians, the, Chinese, uh, the French, and the US come back and they accept the proposal, which wasn't too difficult. They accepted their own proposal. The Iranians, however, don't really come back with any answer. There's neither a yes, there's not a no, there's a request for more meetings, there's a request for additional mechanisms to guarantee that this would be delivered. Uh, and by first and second week of November, you start to see that there's a little bit of a panic spreading in the White House because they're not gonna get their deal. And now, essentially, all of the time that they could allocate for diplomacy had been more or less lost. There were some efforts to get other countries to try to talk to the Iranians, even the Japanese at one point were quite involved, but nothing could happen. And the real problem was not necessarily the trust issue, specifically was the fact that the Iranians couldn't come to a yes because of the domestic political turmoil. They could, the, the elite could not come to a decision. So the administration then moves to sanctions and has the hope of imposing sanctions in the Security Council by February of 2010. Um, and that was critical for the administration because they needed to show a very skeptical domestic audience and particularly a very skeptical Congress that yes, Obama tried diplomacy, yes, it didn't lead to anything but look at the sanctions that we are going to be able to secure in the Security Council as a result of this. And there was a lot of pressure on the administration to get those sanctions quickly because Congress was threatening to go forward with their own sanctions. And it was important for the administration to not let that happen. But February passes, March passes, April passes, there's no sanctions, there's no consensus in the Security Council, the Russians and the Chinese are pushing back, and Obama has almost nothing to show for for his big gamble on diplomacy on Iran. And then at that last moment, something happens that the administration did not expect. Russia, uh, Turkey and Brazil, two countries that are in the Security Council, who never really had any direct involvement in this issue, decide that they're gonna go on their own and try to find a solution to this issue and try to mediate, essentially, and get the Iranians to agree to the original deal. On May 16th, President Lula of Brazil travels to Iran. Uh, the day after, Erdogan of Turkey comes, and they have an 18-hour negotiation with the Iranians, quite intense, quite difficult at times. But at the end of the negotiations, lo and behold, they have managed to get the Iranians to agree to ship out 1,200 kilos of LEU, put it in Turkey, the difference was that, um, in an escrow and not get their fuel pads back until 12 months later. They're ecstatic. They think that they have resolved a major international crisis. The second phone call that Amurim, the Brazilian foreign minister does after leaving Tehran is to Secretary Clinton. He calls her, they have a conversation, he explains to her the details of the deal. Um, and to his surprise, she makes it very clear to him, the deal is absolutely unacceptable. What Turkey and Brazil did not know was that on the Friday before, only two days before Lula arrived in Tehran, Russia and China had finally come around and agreed to a sanctions draft in the Security Council. And as a result, the administration was faced with a choice of either accepting a nuclear breakthrough or to go with sanctions. Now, the administration had the case because there were a lot of facts on the ground that had changed. By the time the, Iran, the Brazilians went to, Turk, uh, to Iran, Iran's stockpile had increased to 2,400 kilos. You're taking 1,200 out of it out, the Iranians still have 1,200 left, and they still have a breakout capability. Moreover, the Iranians had now enriched uranium to 20%, which they had not done in October 2009, which the West viewed as a provocation. And as a result, they dismissed the case and said essentially, the due date for that original deal had been passed. 
And it became quite uh, tense between the administration and the Brazilians and the Turks. And there was a lot of personal attacks against both Erdogan and Lula. In fact, the Turks were quite unlucky because this all happened at the same time as the flotilla uh, occurred. So there was a lot of negative press for Turkey already. And it got to the level that at some point, about 10 days later, someone in Lula's office in Brazil decided to leak a letter from President Obama to President Lula, dated April 20th, only about three weeks before Lula went to Tehran, in which in that letter, President Obama tells the president of Brazil that it would be of tremendous value if Lula could convince the Iranians to give up 1,200 kilos of LEU and get the Iranians to agree not to get back their LEU, uh, their fuel pads until 12 months later. There was no mention that there was a need to bring out more LEU out of Iran. There was no mention even of the 20% issue. In fact, the Brazilians and the Turks followed that letter word by word in their negotiations. And one of their negotiators told me that they even showed the Iranians the letter in order to convince the Iranians that if you agree to this, we already have secured America's agreement. So why did then the Obama administration not agree to this? The arguments that you know, the numbers have changed, et cetera, are not invalid, but they're just not central. The real reason why the administration couldn't, in their estimation, do this was because they had completely run out of political space. Congress was coming at them as a steamroller, and Congress would have passed their own sanctions. And then you would have been in a situation in which the congressional sanctions would have targeted China and Russia. And you would have had a significant rift and a conflict within the P5, which then the Iranians could take advantage of. The administration had went to great extent trying to unify the Security Council so that the Iranians wouldn't be able to play the different sides against each other. If they had agreed to the Turkish-Brazilian deal, their fear was, because of their lack of ability or lack of political capital or willingness to stop Congress from imposing its own sanctions, it would have led to uh, a situation in which the Iranians could once again start taking advantage of differences within the Security Council. What is so sad about this is that it shows that just as before, the real problem, the ultimate problem, the decisive problem at the end is that the domestic pol politics of both Iran and the United States tends to create obstacles on the road for a deal at the last moment. That's what happened in 09 when the Iranians could not come to a yes. And only six months later, the same situation happens in the United States. But it also shows that there's no such thing as actually having exhausted diplomacy because there's no negotiations that the US have been able to conduct that have been successful that have been done in this type of instantaneous manner. In fact, the title of my book, and I'll stop there, is uh, A Single Roll of the Dice. It's a quote from one of Obama's own officials who told me that by the time Obama had managed to get everyone to the table in 09, so much of his political capital and maneuverability was lost. So that the policy had become a gamble on a single roll of the dice. He needed a quick victory or nothing at all. He could not go for anything else. And there's just not been any cases in which an enmity of this depth of 30 years long have been able to be resolved in that type of a fast food diplomacy manner. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Trita. Um, we, we are engaged, as you mentioned, in what's probably the most dysfunctional relationship in the world today. I don't think there are any two countries that have been at each other's throats this intensely for this long. Uh, we're lucky enough to have somebody who had a close-up view of the Iranian government during some of this period and, and still is spending a lot of his time in Iran. So I'd like to ask you, Abbas Maliki, if you could uh, tell us your comments and whether you saw developments more or less the same way. Thank you, Stefan. I think uh, if you see it in Tehran and look at the Iran-US relation, situation would be totally different because uh, you should look at the President Obama, which did the first day in White House, he extended and he signed a decree to extend the 1995 sanction on Iran 
which after uh, in 1996 it was the ILSA, became ILSA. And yesterday, again, President Obama signed another year extension of that uh, sanction. Therefore, uh, the case uh, which uh, um, Trita wants to uh, discuss in his book that maybe President Bush policies over Iran and President uh, Obama are different, it is not well interpreted in Tehran because they look at the output of foreign policy and its production in uh, Washington, which is sanction, uh, threat to military action. The case, as uh, Trita said, about the uh, working in United Nations with permanent member of or elite members of uh, Security Council, and also the case which is uh, very important in region, working with Arab states, Israel, and others to contain Iran, contain even for $100. Sometimes the undersecretary for Treasury, he goes to other countries to, uh, to block any trade between any businessman and Iranian counterparts. Therefore, uh, I think in Iran, the case is not serious that uh, President Obama wants or wanted to do something with Iran, to have rapprochement with Iran, something like that. And I have some uh, reservations about the book also. I don't know. Is it, uh, first issue which I want to say, this is a good book and well organized and uh, access to officials but, and decision makers, but I think Trita had, has had more access to Americans than Iranians, and it is, I think, one weakness of this book. Iranian side, they have many, many positions, uh, opinions, elite in Tehran, the prof professors in political sciences, the ministries, national security councils, and others, they have also some um, views which I want uh, to propose him to look at them also, maybe in the second volume of book. Second, uh, most quotes are referred to a, to a or many senior Obama administration officials, which I cannot imagine is he one person or many person, but I don't know who are them and why the uh, words of them are so bold in every chapter. It is the first sentence in the top. I don't know. It is uh, very important that who are those people that they have done this case. And the case, uh, I think the conclusion is right that sustained diplomacy is the only diplomacy that remains largely unexplored and likely achieving results amounting to more than simply kicking that can down the road. It is good, but really, the case which he mentioned first, in first chapter of book, which refers to a proposal which Iranians, they did in 2003. I want to say it is not, uh, maybe it is not very, um, clear. Uh, the case is that in 2003, a gentleman, Sadeh Kharrazi, who was Iranian ambassador in Paris, uh, sent a letter via ambassador, Swiss ambassador in Tehran, by Timothy Goldman, to Washington. And he proposes a grand bargaining between two countries. And uh, this is very, very important uh, document in the view of Trita. And uh, then uh, the American side rejected this uh, grand bargaining. I want to say maybe it is not uh, uh, important as he mentioned, because as I know, Iranian leader did not aware of this case. Iranian president on that time, President Khatami also says that I cannot remember this case. The two, sec two other uh, officials in this case is uh, Mr. Rouhani in National Security Council, Secretary of National Security Council. Also, he says that I was not aware. Only the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Kharrazi, became silent when he, 
some people, they ask him, is it true or not? But anyhow, this proposal, really it is not uh, rational for Iran to propose to end support for Hamas and Islamic Jihad, simultaneously pressure them to cease any attack on Israel, disarmament of Hezbollah, signing of additional protocol to NPT, because additional protocol to NPT was signed by Iranian government, but it is in Iranian parliament which is stopped. Full cooperation against all terrorist organizations and work with United States for formation and non-sectarian government in Iraq, <coughs> acceptance of Beirut Declaration of Arab League, which was Saudi plan for recognition of Israel. I want to say these issues are not totally together. Really, Iran cannot accept non-Islamic republic. Even I think other government in Tehran also cannot do that because these are some issues which refers to Iranian national interest, and it needs more and more discussion to say suddenly in one letter that we agree all of these issues. In return of what? To MKO members handed over to something, something to Iranians. Yes, it is important, but not important as the support of Syria, Lebanon, Hezbollah, Hamas for Iran, which is very important because of the security interest of Iran or something like that. I want to say maybe this book would be reviewed in depth about these case. And other issue which I want to raise is that in some part of this book, he says that Ayatollah Khomeini also like Shah did trade with Israel and he had relations with the Israeli government. It is wrong because Ayatollah Khomeini, really he was honest in his job and his duty and if he did that, he could, uh, he could say and he must tell to the people. But he said that he, it, it is very delicate a brigade of uh, Revolutionary Guard, they went to Lebanon to fight with Israel. He mentioned that the way of to, uh, to liberate Jerusalem is passing from Karbala. It means that during Iran-Iraq war, it is better to concentrate to Saddam Hussein, and it is better to win in uh, a patriotic war with Saddam Hussein, which invaded some part of Iranian territories. Instead of going to Israeli territories or Palestinian territories or Lebanese south part of Lebanon and weaken the other frontier in the Khuzestan um, uh, and south part of Iran. A nuclear issue also, as Trita said, the rejection of Brazil Turkey initiative by US was very um, strange for Iranians. And another important issue is that Mr. Ahmadinejad proposed last September in New York that we are ready to, uh, to receive 20% uh, ur enriched uranium from abroad and to halt all of activities for enriched uranium from low 3.5 to 20 percent. But nobody uh, answered to this proposal from Washington when he was in New York. And you know, I want to say the case is very complicated. The other issues, human rights, terrorism, Arab Spring, and the case which he mentioned about Iran's election in 2009, despite of all of the discussions which we can do that, I think in his book it is not fair to talk about internal situation in Iran without referring to the uh, different parties which they were there and they have many other op opinions. And I think it is not re relevant to talk about uh, domestic issues in Iran when we are talking about Mr. Obama's foreign policy about Iran. What would be in future, I am optimistic because 
I am teaching future studies in Sharif University, but at the same time, I think this is really it's very uh, odd that the, as Trita also says in his book, the 33 years old US-Iran enmity is no longer a phenomenon, it is an institution. And I think in Congress, it's very clear that Iran, Iran's policy, Iran's lobby, Iran's uh, public relations doesn't work in Washington DC in Capitol Hill. And I think we must look at this case and we must think about some new ways to talk with congressmen and congresswomen more. Thank you. And for that, um, would you like to respond to a couple of Certainly comments for you? Thank you. Thank you. That, uh, I very much appreciate you taking the time to um, review the book and come with your uh, points, uh, some of them that I would definitely uh, agree with, some of them that we may differ on. Um, let me take off a couple of quick ones first and then focus on perhaps some of the more um, substantive ones. Uh, it is absolutely correct my access to Iranian officials for this book was not the same as it was for the previous book. And that is not because of my lack of desire for interviewing them, it's because of lack of ability to travel to Iran and the lack of willingness of Iranian officials to actually make themselves available for interviews. I think that is ultimately a big um, uh, self-inflicted wound by the Iranians in the sense that the less they're willing to be open and talk and provide interviews, the less the rest of the world can understand what their perspective is and how they are uh, working. Fortunately, however, I did have access to some, including some of the negotiators, and that helped at least bridge a little bit of that gap. But I do agree that it would have been um, preferable to have more. The fact that the American officials in particular are not quoted, in fact, very few of the, uh, by name, very few of the Western officials are quoted by name, that is a function of the reality that I was conducting these interviews in 2010. These people are still in power. This is still a very ongoing issue, extremely sensitive. And it's either accepting that term in which they will share with you information on background, but you cannot quote them by name because these people are still sitting. That's just one of the rules of the game. It's, I didn't invent that game as a reality. Uh, but in order to make sure that you get around the problem of that, in order to make sure that you're not talking to a few people who under the guise of anonymity may say things that are not true, is that you try to interview as many officials as possible, cross-check what they're saying to make sure that you can uh, get an estimation of the veracity of what they're saying. Um, in regards to the 2003 proposal, for that I did conduct a lot of interviews in Iran, and I think there's a common phenomenon both on the US side and the Iranian side. On the US side, the Bush administration officials, most of them uh, have ranged from denying that the document ever existed. Once it found its way into the Washington Post, they could no longer deny that it existed. Then they went and denied that it was real. Then they denied that the font was of the right size. Then they denied that you know, it was an Iranian proposal uh, because it was embarrassing for them. It was embarrassing for them. Uh, the fact that they dismissed out of hand a proposal. Similar type of thing seems to exist on the Iranian side, which is that the dismissal of the proposal is also somewhat embarrassing and, uh, and mindful of how skittish Iranian officials have been when it comes to taking a risk for some peacemaking. They want to disassoci disassociate themselves from it. Uh, unfortunately, that's, that's a byproduct of the type of political tensions that exist both inside the countries on this issue and between them. So that's inescapable. Um, on the issue of uh, Khomeini's knowledge about the fact that there was a lot of trade between Iran and Israel at the time, I think it's, it's very well established. And, and again, I had interviews with Iranian officials about that. Again, one of those points that is embarrassing for a regime that tries to retain some sort of an image of ideological purity. But the fact that it, it happened, I think, um, is quite unquestionable. Now, on to the issue that I think is very important that you raised. Uh, and I address it in depth in the book, there were a lot of skepticism on the Iranian side. I would say perhaps even some fear on the Iranian side of what Obama actually would be and what would it mean if suddenly there is a president in the United States that actually is willing to talk to the other side. Uh, after 30 years of enmity and non-negotiations, people get accustomed to that and they're 
they may not like it, but they know how to handle it. But suddenly handling it, a president that is open for diplomacy was something that I think at times uh, created some anxiety in Iran. But then there's these exaggerated expectations on both sides. The fact, for instance, as you mentioned, Dr. Maliki, that the President of the United States renewed the sanctions um, gives the impression that this is a thoughtful process and then there's a debate and then there's a decision to renew them. These sanctions are being renewed automatically. And they will not be not renewed unless there is a significant change on the ground. Neither side has shown any significant inclination to give a concession of substance prior to a diplomatic process. And that is a problem, because usually in a diplomatic engagement, if there is a goodwill gesture of substance, it actually tends to increase the likelihood of the success of the negotiations. But neither the Iranians nor the United States have really been in the business of doing so. And you can see that very clearly right now in the preparation for the next round of talks. Whatever is gonna come out of those talks is gonna come out after the process is successful, not as a gesture prior to the negotiations because the amount of tension, amount of unwillingness to take risk are that great. Just as the Iranians are complaining that Obama renewed the sanctions, et cetera, et cetera, and as a result, how can we take him seriously? Uh, the US has its own complaints about those uh, issues, saying that, well, the Iranians could have done X, Y, and Z on the nuclear issue, why didn't they do this, why didn't they do that? Um, bottom line is that there becomes, comes to a level in which the skepticism becomes self-fulfilling and self-perpetuating. There's such skepticism about any willingness on the other side to do anything, so that we dismiss all of the uh, openings that may occur, and we won't take the other side seriously unless they give a concession on of substance prior to the talks, while we recognize that we ourselves would never would be willing to do that uh, because of our domestic political situation. And it's locked the two countries in, in this uh, almost paralysis. Um, and I think the only way to get out of it is to have absolutely no expectations, no expectations whatsoever, that either side would give anything of substance prior to talks, while having expectations that in order for the talks to succeed, both sides, need to give something of substance in order to make a compromise workable. But it will come as a product of diplomacy, not as a precondition to diplomacy. We've always had uh, this debate, and I think it's still going on in the United States. Uh, there is a feeling that uh, negotiating is something that you only do with your friends. Uh, but actually, the only way to resolve crises is to negotiate with the people that you really don't like. Uh, Sometimes I think that uh, America and Americans learn two terrible, very bad lessons from World War II. Uh, one was Pearl Harbor, or what uh, Dick Cheney came to describe as the 1% doctrine. If there's a 1% chance that any country in the world might ever attack you, you better go attack them first. So uh, you develop this mindset that uh, the whole world is ready to, to pounce on you at any moment, in which case any concessions at all seem ludicrous. And the other one is Munich. The Munich experience has given many Americans, or confirmed in the uh, minds of many Americans, this view that all negotiation is surrender. Once you negotiate, you've already given up more than Americans should give up. And I think these are some deeper psychological problems we need to leap over before we can focus on the particular one we're talking about tonight. Uh, I've got a couple of more specific questions, but time is running out, and I'd like to give members of the audience a chance to participate. We've got a couple of uh, microphones down here. Um, so I'm not going to assert my uh, privilege as the uh, chair to uh, monopolize the discussion. Uh, please come down if you want to. Uh, if you want to ask a question, identify yourself. Go right ahead. Um, thank you. My name is James Williamson. Uh, very interesting and important uh, discussion. Um, just a couple of quick background observations, and then and then my question. Um, here we are at MIT, which uh, at, there was a time when the Department of Nuclear Engineering here at MIT was believed to be an extension of the government of Iran. Uh, it, that was a different time. It was when the Shah of Iran was in power, thanks to the United States. The Shah was also the commencement speaker at Harvard in 1968. So there's a, 
I think, an ignominious history that we have to uh, reckon with as Americans. Um, I also am troubled, and I think it's important, and it's important to my question, by the threats of basically a nuclear attack uh, that Israel, in particular, are making. And, and when the US government says no options are off the table, basically what they're saying is, we might, we're considering launching a nuclear attack. Uh, with those kinds of threats, one might make the case that, is, that, that Iran uh, have a right to either preemptive or preventive war. Uh, and why wouldn't they? So that's background for my question, which is, wouldn't it make sense, given that Israel have 250 nuclear weapons outside of the framework of the NPT, to have a, a serious discussion about a Middle East-wide nuclear-free zone? And haven't there, in fact, been serious proposals put on the table? Why aren't they discussed in the American media? Why isn't the Obama administration taking this seriously as part of their much vaunted diplomacy? Very good question. Um, as you know, I actually lived through uh, the development of, the, of an earlier one. There, there is a nuclear free zone in Latin America now, and this wasn't always uh, taken for granted. Uh, Argentina had a nuclear program, so did Brazil. Uh, but a process was developed, and under the Treaty of Tlatelolco, uh, all of Latin America now is a nuclear-free zone. I think at the moment, uh, talk of that uh, option is always uh, placed in the anti-Israel uh, drawer. Uh, it's immediately seen that way. W would you like to comment on the possibility of a nuclear-free Middle East, Dr. Maliki? Yes. Um, Iran uh, officially agreed to talk and propose the nuclear free nuclear weapon zone in Persian Gulf and Middle East. But the problem is that the, uh, some uh, countries, like United States, they say that this is very good, but ex except Israel. Except Israel, I don't know how, what is the meaning of this case. And really, the case of a complaint of Iranians to United States, I think it's more than Israel, because the Prime Minister of Israel came to Washington last week, and he did a speech in APEC, and he said the Persian anti-Semitists, the Persian anti-Semitists, not Iran's government anti-Semitists, Persian anti-Semitists, it is a new terminology. When you are looking the history, the role of Cyrus, Astar, all, all of these events, now because of the a small business in Middle East, the one civilization would be under the attack, and nobody says anything in the United States, none, none of media, scholars, intellectuals, like the name of Persian Gulf. The military sector of the United States, officially they say Arabian Gulf. Why? Because the Ahmadinejad, is, the Ahmadinejad speech is what, was not in favor of the United States. These are issues as uh, Iranians, they, are, they have a lot of these cases that I think uh, we can discuss more. Frida, what about uh, nuclear free zone, quickly, Middle East? Um, <clears throat> you would need to have a rather different Congress in place to make that uh, feasible. But American. I think it's very important to talk about it uh, my organization organized a conference on Capitol Hill just a couple of weeks ago, and our, one of our panelists was Hans Blix, the former head of the IEA, and he's very actively arguing in favor of this, because reality is you can't really have a piecemeal uh, solution to this. You need to go beyond that, and uh, even though it is politically impossible or looks unfeasible right now, uh, one has to remember one thing. Political landscapes and political capital is not something that falls on your head. It's not something you get from Santa Claus. It's something that you create. And if you want to have a political landscape that is conducive to the success for the idea of a WMD free zone, then that political landscape needs to be created. And it begins by having a conversation about it. But I wanted to add another thing, because the, the question was very good, and the background to the question was also very good, because it was a reference of what happened um, just a couple of weeks ago when Netanyahu was in town. I think uh, it's important to note that in spite of all of the different hawkish positions and statements and speeches, 
Uh, on the issue of substance, the visit actually became a, a, a victory for those who did not want to see a military confrontation. Because the Netanyahu government was pushing very hard, very hard, together with supporters in Congress, to get the Obama administration to adopt the red line that Iran cannot have a nuclear capability. And what a nuclear capability actually means is it's quite ambiguous, um, but it's oftentimes meant to indicate that they can't even have enrichment, which they already have and they know, they already have the knowledge of it. The Obama administration's red line, which was long standing, but essentially became public in this uh, uh, last couple of weeks, is that their red line is that Iran, the red line is weaponization, that Iran cannot build nuclear weapons. That's a very different red line. It's a very a red line that doesn't have a trigger that has been triggered yet because the US intelligence says that Iran is currently not having an active nuclear weapons program and the Iranians have not made a decision to weaponize. Uh, and we don't know if they would make that decision. So you have a lot of space left there. Part of the reason why the administration has this red line is because it's the red line supported by the US military. The US military views the Israeli red line as a fast track towards a war because essentially, not permitting Iran to have a nuclear capability means not only do you have to go and uh, bomb all the facilities, you also have to assassinate and kill all the scientists, and then you have to go and burn all the physics books. <laughs> it's not only impossible, but it's, you know, it's, you know, it, it's, it's ridiculous, frankly ridiculous. But Obama stood extremely firm on this point and did not yield on this issue, which a lot of people thought that he potentially would. So whereas there was a lot of heated rhetoric, and I'm not saying that the rhetoric is not dangerous in and of itself, on the key issue of substance, Obama stood quite firmly against further militarization. Go ahead, please. Is better now? Yes, sir. Yes, um, as a member of the MIT community, as a human rights activist, I was very surprised to see that CIS is setting up, basically promoting a book and discussing it by, without really properly in the, introducing the authors. And I thought in that sense, I put a little light on those issues. Um, based on the so-called, uh, based on the US court document released recently. It, if somebody look at those court release document, it shows clearly Trita Parsi and his organization, NIAC, are, can be counted as a um, top Iranian regime lobbyist in the United States. These are a court release document, and if you look at these, there are hundreds of them. I don't have, but. All right, look, I want, to, I want to call into this now. We don't, I, I want to try to get to the discussion of the issues that are raised here rather than the people that are raising them. And um, I, I understand people are, are, this is a very divided community, but, but can I just ask you to uh, leave it at that? We've, we've got your point, and now I want to move on to, no, to another one. No, I'm going to the issue of the group. No, okay. well, keep it very brief. Sure, I'm going to. The one of the brief I read from it was from so-called uh, Mr. Um, Ahmadi, was the review on the book, was written on the Wall Street Journal in January 23rd. I'm just to give a better balance, because here I saw the reviewing of the book by uh, lobbies and the Iranian government sub officials. I'm going to read a little bit, a few lines from that review from Wall Street Journals by Mr. Ahmadi. He says, basically, in a, in a single roll of dice, Trita Parsi tries to account for the failure, for this failure, but rather than re-examining US policy and its underlying assumption, Mr. Parsi spent much of the book casting blame on the wide range of actors for Mr. Obama's in, in um, ability to discuss the clear, uh, to disarm the clinical regime through diplomatic means. Okay, sir. I think Such so, blame, uh, just I think, one more line, uh, one know, more line. I think we understand, we got the point, I understand. I've had a couple of bad reviews in my time, and I think, I, I, don't, I don't want to dwell on them. Well, it's one of, the, one of the troubles authors have to bear. Let's not add to it here. Thank you. Go ahead, sir, please. Uh, 
Hi. Um, is this on? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, my name is Artina Afkami. I'm with the New York Times, and I'm also at the Fletcher School. Thank you, Dr. Parsi, uh, for coming out here, and also Dr. Maliki and Mr. Kinzer. Um, it's been wonderful. Uh, my question is, um, Ray Takei of the Council on Foreign Relations has said the motivation behind Iran's nuclear program is partly that after 30 years of trying this tack of independence and self-sufficiency, Iran wants to come back to the table and developing uh, not a nuclear way, not a weaponization, not developing nuclear weapons, but rather a nuclear weapons capability is the easiest track for them to get a seat at the table of the international community today. And I wanted you uh, both to respond to that. Thank you. Why is Iran pursuing this track? <laughs> really, <clears throat> Iranians from 2,500 years ago until now, this is a civilization and they are very smart, they are active, they are thinking, they are trying to build a new civilization again. And the Esfahan architecture, the other part of Iran, Persepolis and others showed, Iranians, they don't have to have access to nuclear weapon. It is rational because the Iranian threats or enemies or rivalries or competitors, they are in two levels. One level is neighboring countries. From 1958 until 2003, it was Iraq which was the first threat to Iran because of the essence and nature of the Ba'ath Party and uh, Abdul Karim Qasim, after Abdul Karim Qasim, the case of the Hassan ul Bak, Mr. Uh, Saddam Hussein, and others. After removing of Ba'ath Party in Iraq, it is not a threat from Iraq now, maybe two years ago later. In Afghanistan, it was Al-Qaeda. For uh, Iran's balance of power, in this level, Iran doesn't need to nuclear weapon. Iranian conventional military sector is very strong. It is the strongest in this region. One million soldiers in ordinary army and in revolutionary guard. Air fighters, naval forces, they are even players in the Mediterranean Sea, Red Sea, Indian Ocean, and Oman Sea. Therefore, it doesn't need. The second level is the countries like Russia, United States, China, or India, in this level, Iran cannot compare itself with these countries in nuclear weapon. If Iran had access to nuclear weapon, it would be one or two, two warheads or one warhead, comparing with that, which you mentioned now, 250, 500, 3,000 warheads. Therefore, the best way for Iran is to allocate its budget to other parts of energy. And the uh, oil and gas, conventional, exhaustible energies, they are the most important part of Iran's policies. And the last point is that in uh, energy, in peaceful energy issues also, Iran has only one nuclear power plant in Boucher, which has 1,000 megawatt electricity. Iranian capacity for electricity is 50,000 megawatts. It is 150s, 2% of electrical ca capacity. Therefore, it is not too high. But when United States says to Iranians, you cannot have access to nuclear technology, they say, we must. Because the other gentleman said, Similar to MIT, there is a university in Tehran, Sharif University of Technology. And engineers, they are the same as here. Why United States say that you cannot have access to technology of uh, nuclear? Then maybe they say you cannot have access to, you must not have access to nano, biotechnology, laser, and other physics. For this reason, Iranians, they reiterated to have access. But really, they don't want to reach to the threshold of nuclear weapon. Thank Sorry. You. Can I, can I just chime into that? Um, I think what Ray is 
pointing to, it, there is one conception in the US government, which I think is a minority conception, which is at the end of the day, the Iranians are trying to cut a deal with the West and try to see how they can essentially achieve decontainment, to be reintegrated into the political and economic structures of the region. Um, and as a result, perhaps they're willing to use the nuclear issue as something that would force this issue, that essentially would force the United States to come to the table, because at the end of the day, had it not been for all of these developments, this non-dialogue situation between the two countries probably could have continued for quite some time. Um, I think there is a certain level of truth in that assumption. The problem is this. As this conflict continues, and as the two sides continue in this negative dynamic in which both are trying to impose as much pain as possible onto the other, from the US side, we're imposing more and more sanctions, and they've become quite crippling. On the Iranian side, the, the way for them to escalate is to further expand their nuclear program, raise it to the 1975% level, open up new facilities, et cetera, et cetera. The more this is done, the more the in original steps or the previous steps become irreversible. There was a point in which I think perhaps for the Iranians to suspend enrichment for a long period of time, they suspended it for 20 months, was not an impossibility because ultimately they did that. It's next to an impossibility, it seems like right now that they would do so. And perhaps if the con situation continues, um, the level of 20% enrichment will also become increasingly difficult to negotiate about because you have this pride and other factors kicking in as well. On the US side, you have a similar problem. A lot of the different sanction, sanctions that are currently in place, uh, once they have been imposed by Congress, they become almost irreversible. They're not fully irreversible, but the difficulty for Congress to actually lift these sanctions, which is a, quite an important factor if you want to use them as a leverage in a negotiation, is very limited. In fact, I don't know how many people in this room knew that the last sanctions that were lifted on Iraq were lifted in 2010, seven years after mission accomplished. Even in the case of Libya, Libya it took several years. So even if there is some likelihood that the Iranians are willing to um, uh, negotiate this away in order to be able to get the containment. The problem is that the longer this uh, conflict remains in place, the more difficult it will be to actually move some of these variables. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Carol Savitz from the Security Studies Program here at MIT. Uh, my question is about Russia, and Bushir actually gave me the perfect segue into it. Russia, of course, built the Bushir reactor, provides the fuels. There's a deal about returning the fuel rods. Uh, Vladimir Putin, as candidate Putin, uh, wrote an article just before the election talking about foreign policy issues. In it, he said that Iran had a right to enrichment, but only under full and transparent IAEA uh, observation, supervision, et cetera. So my question to you is, is there a role for Russia to play in this mediation effort? Would Iran accept, in a sense, Putin's formulation and then, I guess, in terms of the United States, would we, the United States, be willing to accept Russia as a true mediator? Dr. Maliki, would you like to start? Yes, uh, Russia, really, the impression of Russia in Iran is not so good. <laughs> because of the, the historical uh, background, Iran has lost many territories in Transcaucasia and uh, Central Asia during two wars in 1812 and 1828. But at the same time, uh, Iranians, they don't look at the United States as a country with high tech in nuclear issue. They don't believe because they feel that the United States also is, has the old technology in nuclear sciences. And you remember Pittsburgh uh, uh, event. And uh, the last uh, power plant of United States was established in 1979. Maybe these years they are trying to build new one. Anyhow, this is Europe. Europe, which Iran is eager to work with Europe in nuclear sciences, OK? 
But at the same time, fairly, Russia supports Iran's, Iran's foreign policy in different levels, and it is very important for Iran. The first level is international level. Russia says that when United States said this is unipolar system, Russians, they oppose by Iranian card. And Iran also supports Russia in this case. Second, in region, in Central Asia, Russia and Iran, they are cooperating in Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, in Azerbaijan, Armenia. Third, in Caspian Sea, in Islamic uh, countries, in uh, Eurasia, in Shanghai cooperation. Therefore, I want to say uh, Iranian foreign policy has very good and close relations with Russia. At the same time, the economic and relations, foreign relations, trades are not so high. It's about $4 billion, comparing with China, which is $40 billion, or with the European Union, which is $10 billion. It's very low. Anyhow, Iran works to Russia very closely, but at the same time, Iran knows that Russia's technology Russia's economic, political situation is with rest are some restrictions, and they need Western investment. Therefore, uh, with cautious, Iran works with Russia. Trina, Russia, and Iran. Well, I would like to enlarge the question because I think you're putting on your finger on something very important. Are there any willing and able and acceptable? mediators out there. And I think in a sense one could say that it's definitely needed because the current mechanism for diplomacy is quite crippled because you have a P5 plus one channel with the Iranians in which none of the P5 plus one states trust Iran and Iran does not trust any of those states. Even if they may have better relations with one or two of them, there's really not much of a, a strong relationship there. So you have an almost complete absence of trust. Then you have a different problem. Amongst the P5 plus one, there is no unity on what the objective with diplomacy is. What is the end state that the P5 plus one wants to achieve? They have different end states. The French and the uh, UK tend to be more in favor of zero enrichment. The US seems to be willing to accept it on the circum certain circumstances, and China, Chinese and the Russians are not at all as hawkish on that issue. There's not even agreement on what strategy to use? So the only level that there is an agreement on is what tactic to use, and that is sanctions. That's part of the reason why sanctions is such a significant uh, feature in all of this. And then there is an agreement on the fact that they have to be united, because when they're not united, the Iranians can play them against each other. But it's essentially led to a situation that even a state like Russia that actually can talk to Iran without paying a high political cost domestically is a bit limited in its ability to try new initiatives, et cetera, because there's a fear of splitting the unity at the P5. And then you have then the potential of states outside of the P5 who would step in. And you have one example, and that is Brazil and Turkey. They succeeded and they got punished for it. And as a result, there's not a lot of countries out there that are willing to go and try that again, uh, fearing that even if they end up being successful, which is um, not a high likelihood, it's a very tough issue, that they nevertheless will end up paying it too high of a price for that. That's one of the sad lessons from the Turkish-Brazilian um, uh, chapter in all of this. I, I remember I was in Europe a couple of months ago and it was at a time when the Europeans were very, very concerned. They were just about to pass their old sanctions and they were really concerned that they were heading towards a military confrontation. And some of the non-EU3 foreign ministers were you could see having some interest in seeing if they perhaps could try to do something to avoid disaster. But what kept on coming back to them is um, there may not be a desire, there may not be a welcoming from either side for having any real mediators come into the, into the middle here. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, my name is Peter Swartz. I'm at MIT Political Science. Um, thank you for the talk. I actually have a question that dovetails right onto that nicely. And my question was about the Chinese and Russians. Um, they're often lumped together as opposing, or sort of slowing down sanctions at least, like in February 2010, like you were just discussing. And I wonder if you could talk about their motivation and whether it's 
um, if it's similar or if there's difference in sort of their feelings and who takes the lead in, uh, in really sort of slowing things down if that's what's going on. Thank you. You wanna go first? First. <laughs> okay. Um, I can't claim to have any expertise on the Russians and the Chinese, but I think there's a couple of things that can be said. Um, I, I wouldn't characterize it that they like to slow it down or that, you know, I've heard some people say that the Russians are not actually interested in non-proliferation and things of that nature. I, I don't know if I would agree with that assessment. I think what is true is that the Russians have made quite a lot of money and a lot of benefits out of this ongoing um, US-Iranian tension. Because every time the US needs something from the Russians, because they're in the Security Council and their absence of their veto is critical, the US ends up giving various things to the Russians, various concessions, for instance, in order to get them to agree to the sanctions in May 2010, the Russians um, requested that there would be changes to the missile defense system. Uh, there were issues about START II, the reset, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of concessions were given to the Russians in order to get them to agree. Then the Russians can go to the Iranians and say, well, look, you see what the United States is offering us. Uh, what do you offer us? And this is a game that's been going on for quite some time, and they've you know, uh, been happily in the middle, benefiting from the ongoing conflict. I've not seen that they necessarily actively have tried to prolong it, though. The Chinese, on the other hand, are making a killing out of the West sanctioning itself out of the Iranian economy. Because now you have a tremendous amount of Chinese goods that are flooding the Iranian market, creating a lot of problems for local industries as well. Um, and Iran is increasingly getting sucked into the Russian and the Chinese orbit, which in the long term, in my view, it's difficult to see how that is beneficial strategically to the United States. Do you see that also, Iran being moved towards uh, China and Russia? No, no. The uh, Iranian society doesn't want to go to Russians or Chinese because we have, Iranian society has a very, very negative historical uh, experiences with these two nations in the past. And uh, this, this is uh, not a very a contemporary issue. It is the historical. For this reason, Iranians really, during Marxism, Marxist, Leninism, Bolshevik uh, system in Soviet Union also, it was the same. This is something in, in Iranian mentality, which they are not pro the centralized systems, communism, Marxism, and something like that. For this reason, I don't think Iran wants to go. But as Trita said, sometimes pressures from United States and European countries moved Iran uh, to, go to go to that system. For example, now threats from United States, Israel, military, something like that, Iran goes to SCO, Shanghai Cooperation Organizations. Iran knows that Shanghai Cooperation Organization cannot do anything for Iran in Persian Gulf. But at least this is some maneuver, some a space for maneuver. Chinese and Russians, Iran fully aware that these two countries, when they deal with the other side, United States or Europe, they can ignore the Iranian national interest easily. For, for example, you should compare Iran and Syria. For Syria, Russia and China, they vetoed the case of the, Russia vetoed the uh, Security Council resolution. But for Iran, they did not do that. I want to say Iran is a loneliness country, very long, it has a lonely strategic situation. And it is good for Iran because they receive to this point that they must pay the cost of the independence as they did in Iraq, Iraq war. Wow. But, but, I, you hear that often that this is the price for independence, but Iran is not gaining independence. It's getting greater dependence on Russia and China. The only thing it's become independent from is from the West. But it's not really independence, because now um, 
in the absence, if the Chinese, for instance, were to stop buying Iranian oil, Iran would be in a tremendously vulnerable position. So are, aren't the Iranians actually more dependent now than before? No, it's not true. As I told you, Russian-Iranian trade is $4 billion. It is not dependence. Uh, with China, yes, in 2011 it was 20, uh, it was 40 billion dollars, 20 billion dollars uh, for oil and gas, and 20 for goods and commodities. But let me, what is the United States independence in good and commodities in this the market in United States? There is not anything except Chinese. But nobody says United States is uh, dependent to China. I want to say. Despite of Actually, the high trade, high, tra <laughs> high trade between China and Iran, but Iran is not dependent to China. For this reason, Iran has relations with Taiwan. Many issues, there are different views between China and Iran. At the same time, Iran feels that uh, it's better to work with China. And the last point, China's oil which imports from Iran, it's not huge. It is 500,000 barrel per day. It is one, uh, one uh, fourth of Iran, one fifth of Iranian oil export, not production. Europe imports 600,000 barrel per day. China imports 500,000 barrel per day. It's not very high. For this reason, if China doesn't buy this oil, there are other countries like United States to do that. Okay, can I say something on this? Because this is, this is actually important. Um, okay, so the Europeans buy 600,000 barrels, but by June 15th, they will essentially buy zero unless something happens in the negotiations. Part of the American strategy is actually to make Iran as dependent on China as possible because it would then be forced to buy more uh, sell more oil to the Chinese, because there's few other buyers out there uh, that would be able to resist the American pressure not to buy Iranian oil. And then at that point, be in a type of a situation that the US has with North Korea, which is that there's one stop go, one place to go to put pressure on the Iranians, which then truly would mean that Iran is very dependent on the Chinese, even if the economic numbers don't show it. Politically, it has become completely dependent on the Chinese and the Russians. May I? Just give me one, you can go. Give me, give me two sentences. Uh, yes, uh, this is true if after uh, June you mentioned China's import of uh, crude oil from Iran would be raised. But there are many, many other uh, uh, uncertainties and other variables here. The case of crude oil is not like other commodities. The market is reacting very harsh about any lack of the oil supply and demand is very high, as you know, the price of oil. For example, Congress, the, the, they discuss a lot and try to do something to topple Iranian regime, and then they decide to allocate $75 million to do something in Iranian space, uh, virtual space, internet, and satellite televisions. But when when one oil barrel increases its price one dollar, it means that Iranian government receives one billion dollars more annually. And now the price of oil is about more than 110 for Iran. It means that United States wants to reduce the oil price to 20 dollars, but they cannot do that. Therefore, I want to say Yes, it is true that uh, it's bad uh, news that when uh, European Union, they do embargo against Iran's oil. But there are many, many other uh, demands in the, in the world that they need Iranian oil. And they will um, on that happy note, I must say that uh, we've run up to the end of our time. I'm sorry for those that had some questions remaining. There are many questions remaining in this whole issue. Thanks to our guests for shedding a little bit of light on it. Thank, Thank you all you. for coming. Thank you so much. I have to, I have a